second chapter of the book of Daniel prophesied the rise and the fall of four world ruling governments. According to Daniel, it was Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greco-Macedonian Empire, and the Roman Empire. And of course, Daniel started with the, uh, the government that was actually in power at that time, which was Babylon. That's why we knew which ones would follow that because of history in the past. The very last system, according to Daniel 2, verse 40 to 45, was to have ten nations or combination of nations that would make up a world government at the very close of the age. Then in Revelation 17, verse 12 to 14, it also verifies, it says the ten horns you saw are ten kings who have received, have not received a kingdom as yet. So they're going to receive power and authority along with this world governor called the beast, the Antichrist, only for a short time. And other scriptures show that it's going to be 42 months, Revelation chapter 13. And Daniel chapter 12 shows that it will be for the last three and a half years of this time period. There are scriptures in Revelation chapter 2, I mean Daniel 2, Revelation chapter 17 that I've mentioned that absolutely prove that there will be ten groupings of nations that will emerge and they will literally fight Jesus Christ at this last social system as it rises and he comes to destroy it. Let's look just a little further now. In Revelation chapter 13 verse 1, it said, I saw a beast, and this is the fourth world ruling government, talking about the Roman Empire, really, that would rise. And then it was to have ten horns, because you see the fourth beast was to have ten horns. And you can put in your notes, I won't turn there, but Daniel chapter 7, verses 20 to 25, right through there it says, out of the fourth beast there would be revivals that would come along and finally the final revival of that fourth beast, which in history was the Roman Empire, then there would literally be ten groupings of nations. And those ten groupings of nations would literally fight Jesus Christ at His return. Some of those that have already come and gone in history was the Justinian Empire, which was the imperial restoration of the Roman Empire. Justinian was crowned by the Pope in 554 A.D., and that started the revival of the Holy Roman Empire. Then you had the Frankish kingdom that came on the scene, and the Pope literally crowned Charlemagne in 774 A.D., and he actually, well, actually he took the throne then, but he was crowned in 800 A.D. Then Otto the Great came on the scene in 962 and was crowned by the Pope to continue the dynasty of the Roman Empire. Then the Pope crowned Charles the Great in 1520 A.D. to establish what was called the Habsburg Dynasty. Then Napoleon came into power and his kingdom collapsed in 1814. And when you look and see that this time period was to be for 1260 years or 1260 days, a day for a year according to Numbers 14 verse 34 in Bible prophecy many times, that it was to be 1260 years. And from the time of the first revival of the Holy Roman Empire, 554 A.D. until the collapse of Napoleon in 1814 was exactly 1260 years as was stated. Then we saw the rise of another individual. It was Garibaldi began to gather all the various disunited city-states in Italy. And finally Mussolini and Hitler were destroyed. They created a combine with the Roman Catholic Church as the state religion. And finally, this was dissolved with the defeat of the Axis powers in World War II, Italy, Japan, and Germany. Then there were yet to be ten groupings of nations yet to come on the scene. Notice now Revelation chapter 13 verse 3. 
It said one of the heads or revivals of this beast system seemed to have a fatal wound. This is the New International Version. But the fatal wound had been healed. So it came back in full bloom as a nation. The whole world, according to the New International Version, was astonished and followed the beast. But why would the world follow this leader called the beast? Heading up this government, a Mr. William Shirer, who was a correspondent for CBS Radio, wrote in his book, Berlin Diary, concerning Adolf Hitler's rise to power in the 1930s. I quote, I got my first glimpse of Hitler as he drove by the Wurttemberger Hof to his own headquarters at the Dutzer Hof. About 10 a.m., I got caught in a mob of about 10,000 hysterics who jammed the moat in front of Hitler's hotel, shouting, We want the Fuhrer. I was literally shocked at the faces, especially those of the women. When Hitler finally appeared on the balcony for a moment, they looked at him as though he were the Messiah. Hitler's effect on people was not confined to the production of hysteria in crowds. The magic worked equally well on a personal level. Goring, who was probably closer to him than any other German, collapsed under the impact of his extraordinary personality. End of quote from the book, The Occult Reich, page 24. Then on in the same page, it said... I never heard Hitler in person, but I did by radio. Later I talked with some of the men who had been in his intelligence department. It was strange, they said. The sound waves of a speaker's voice can be measured in keeping with his emotions. In other words, on the scale, just like your blood pressure and so on, you see it going up and down, up and down. In the writings here in this book, The Berlin Diary, he said, men have been able to make voice prints and tell the degree of the speaker's anger, fear, and fervency. But the vibrations of Hitler's voice broke all the rules and defied normal explanation. End of quote. He stated in the book that there were no lines on the graph. It was a straight line across. And yet, when you see the pictures of Hitler, you know that he was very, very a fanatic, very emotional in the delivery of his speeches. So this man did defy all the rules of a speaker. Another close associate with Adolf Hitler was Hermann Roshing. Here's what he said, and this is quoted in the same book. He wakes up in the night, screaming and in convulsions. He calls for help and appears to be half paralyzed. He's seized with panic that makes him tremble until the bed shakes. He utters confused and unintelligible sounds, gasping as if to the point of suffocation. Hitler was standing up in his room, swaying and looking around as if he were lost. It's he, it's he, he groaned. He's come for me. His lips were white. He was sweating profusely. Suddenly, he, he uttered a string of meaningless figures, then words and scraps of sentences. It was terrifying. He used strange expressions, strung together in bizarre disorder. Then he relapsed again in silence. But his lips continued to move. He was then given a friction, that's something like an aspirin in Germany, and something to drink. Then he suddenly screamed, there, there, over in the corner, there he is, all the time stamping his feet and shouting, end of quote, the occult Reich, page 54. Another man who was very closely associated with Adolf Hitler in his early days was a Dr. Stein. He was from Vienna, Austria. He specialized in international law. Dr. Stein lectured very widely throughout Asia Minor. 
He was also the guest of dictator, the dictator of Turkey, Kemal Ataturk. He also accompanied King Leopold of Belgium to England as an economic advisor. As an economic advisor, he helped to write King Leopold's speech delivered in the Guild Hall in England that first call for the European common market. He belonged to an organization. Both of these men, King Leopold, headed it up. It was called the Bilderberger Organization. The common market is the express tool that was actually brought about to the start the progress of world government. All this information came from the book Spear of Destiny, written in 1974 by Trevor Ravenscott, page 19 and 20. Now, Dr. Stein described Hitler like this, quote, Adolf Hitler stood beside him like a man in a trance a man over whom some dreadful magic spell had been cast. His face was flushed. His brooding eyes shone with an alien emanation. Could it have been Satan personally? His whole physiognomy and his stance appeared transformed as if some mighty spirit now inhabited his very soul, creating within and around him a kind of evil transfiguration of his own nature and power. He went on to say, Was I a witness of the incorporation of the spirit of the Antichrist in this deluded human soul? Had this tramp from the Doss house momentarily become the vessel of that spirit which the Bible called Lucifer? End of quote. Other people saw the same transformation which Dr. Stein wrote about as Adolf Hitler rose step by step to power. And this was nothing more than the forerunner, the preparation for the next and the final emergence of a world government that would literally be the beast of Revelation 13. Then in Revelation chapter 13 verse 4 it says, Men worship the dragon, that's Satan, because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worship the beast and ask, Who is like the beast? Who can make war with him? Now, what could cause the whole world to be astonished and ask such a question as, Who can make war against the beast? And why would anyone submit to the worship of a man who is possessed possibly by Satan the devil. Let's explore just for a moment now. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 and 17, it says, He, referring to the second beast or religious figure, also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no man could buy or sell. That means transact business unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. What could this mark be? The word mark in the Greek language is sharagma. It literally means a scratch, etching, stamp, or sculpture. This mark, without doubt, will be lines etched, scratched, stamped, or sculptured into the right hand or forehead by the use of laser beams or possibly even the latest invention. There is something even yet more dreadful that is about to come on the scene. Could it be the transplanting and the putting into the hand of a tiny microchip? We'll see. But many people have prophesied and thought that this particular mark of the beast would be something like a German mark, paper currency, because they thought the world government, this beast, would only be the European economic community of ten nations. However, it can't be. Because bankers, 
International bankers and merchants are moving very swiftly and steadily to the new world computer system for credits and debits in a cashless society. They're moving one step at a time so not to alarm the Christian community who are looking for the rise of the 666 system. Economic funds transfer that is being advertised is very convenient. Many people are using them today. No cash to lose. No cash for would-be muggers to relieve you of. Finally, the economic collapse, which has been prophesied for the year 1995 by many economists, but I don't set dates, but they're looking for the collapse of all paper money for the year 1995. This is being moved upon us gradually, as now they're stepping up inflation for the fifth time and possibly two more times by the end of 1994, and it's going to make it impossible for people to be able to buy homes and so on. And they're going to see to it that inflation occurs. The following information was taken from the magazine Voice of the Nazarene. By a, and the editor was W.L. King. Quote, So many shocking, even unbelievable things are taking place before our very eyes. Just recently I read this news item. The French magazine Foy et Rye reported from the United Nations organization in Geneva, Switzerland that plans are worked out to dissolve the United Nations organization to make way for a world tribunal which will seize all possessions. What does the Communist Manifesto state? No one would own possessions. What was the song that John Lennon sang all the time? No one would have possessions. All savings and bank accounts and deposits would be seized. Every man, woman, and child would receive a certain amount of money and a number. This money is already available, according to this article, and in a bank waiting for distribution. Everyone with a number will be employed either in the administrative, the commercial, or the industrial or agricultural branch. This project and this plan also provides for the unification of church and state. The number received by the people will promise the right to buy and sell. Isn't this the same thing that Jesus Christ prophesied nearly 1900 years ago? That proves there's a God. But notice what happened, and I'm still quoting from this article. At the end of the statement, a Christian arose and asked the speaker, what happens to the minorities who will not accept this plan? Here's what the United Nations Organization representative replied. Their number will be canceled with a black line, and they will be deprived of the right to buy and sell, and will thus be forced to destruction. End of quote. This is what's coming, known as the mark of the beast. It will come in your lifetime, and it will come in my lifetime. It's just around the corner, and I'm going to present the evidence today that is so overwhelming that it will absolutely prove that every facet of Revelation 13, verse 16 and 17 is just over the horizon, and it not, might not be Weeks, months, years. It could happen when an emergency is called. <clears throat> and everybody on earth would be forced to take a number. And they're already preparing that with what is called social security numbers. And that all they have to do now is to merge all the systems of the world, all the numbering system with a prefix of 666. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is a book that is also put out in Europe. <clears throat> this particular book is called The Great Common Market Fraud by a Mr. C. Gordon Tether. On page one to three, notice what it says. <clears throat> Excuse me. There is an element of starry-eyed idealism in the pro-market lobby. People who genuinely believe... <clears throat> Excuse me. 
that the true interest of the people of Western Europe would be advanced by wielding them into a European super state ruled by a European super government. And he went on to show who was behind those who were pushing for world government and the building of the European economic community. It was the international bankers and international big businesses called multinational corporations that do business in every nation on the face of the earth. They said that they were working for a one world political and economic system that was to be in place by the year 2000. They were hoping for. Now, these people in this book that did the research and then the writing stated that a certain group of individuals were the ones who were behind, literally behind the scenes and preparing this particular European economic community to lead the way for the rest of the world. And they said it was a group of individuals who came from the Bilderberger organization, then others who were with the Trilateral Commission. And the Trilateral Commission, according to this book, was headed up by multi-millionaire David Rockefeller, and he started the Trilateral Commission in 1973 as an offshoot from the Council on Foreign Relations. And it took the most important people in Europe and the United States and Japan. And they're all working together for world government. There are front organizations, many Illuminati fronts working right now to produce this world government. Some of those organizations are, they're called the Round Table Group of Nine out of England, the Council on Foreign Relations, the United Nations Organization, the Bilderberger Club, the Club of Rome, the Royal Institute for International Affairs in England, the Trilateral Commission. All of these organizations. The market is the chosen instrument of multinationals for creating a world fit for big business to live in. This is how Giovanni Agnelli, who was the head of the Fiat Corporation and a multi-billionaire and head of the steering committee of the Bilderberger Group put it, quote, European integration is our goal. And where the politicians have failed, we industrialists hope to succeed, end of quote. So where the politics of nations have failed, Big business said they would bring together a global network. And this global network of economics is what will pull together the nations of the world and create their one world system. So what did they do as their one of their main steps? They created what is called SWIFT, the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications. SWIFT is an organization that is going to be on every continent on the face of the earth. Every single bank on earth will finally be a part of it. It will be for total cashless society. No coins, no checks. They will use simply the electronic funds transfer, which many people are being suckered into today by having their Social Security checks through direct deposits coming from the government straight into their bank account. No more checks and so on. So this particular organization, SWIFT, according to the magazine Burroughs puts out, said that in 1982 it had already started transmissions of transfers of funds on the European and United States continent. Phase two would bring in the other five continents of the earth. So before it's all over, every continent on earth will have SWIFT operating in it. It's an international financial network. A news release that came from Brussels, Belgium on October 19th of 1977, and it was a Mr. Lawrence A. Gosshorn, who was president and chairman of General Automation Incorporated that was headquartered in Anaheim, California, stated that the transfer of 
funds through total economic means has now opened. The SWIFT organization is now open for business. By 1982, as I mentioned, it had already opened for business in Europe and the United States. Now it is available on every continent on the face of the earth. The network in its first phase was to cover Western Europe, North America. Then it would go on as they began to gain more control over the banks of each nation. Burroughs stated in their Future Developments magazine, Future Developments of SWIFT in 1977, that this SWIFT network would go on until the system became truly worldwide. So there is coming a worldwide economic system. There are two switching stations to begin with, Brussels, Belgium, and Amsterdam, Holland. And a third was being built in Culpeper, Virginia, where Fedwire of the federal government of the United States has its center. All this information was found in the book Electronic Fund Transfer System, The Laws of It. This was a 1980 publication. A Mr. Salem Kerbin wrote a book called Satan's Angels Exposed. He made the following observation about the connection of the International Monetary Fund of the United Nations Organization and the Trilateral Commission. Quote, The Trilateral Commission is an extension of the Council on Foreign Relations. Its ultimate goals is to incorporate Japan, Canada, the United States, and the common market nations of Europe into a one-world socialistic government. The name trilateral is de derived from the fact that the leaders come from the three democratic areas of the world, the United States, Western Europe, and Japan. It was David Rockefeller who handpicked this elite group of 250 individuals in 1973 to begin this organization. They included power shapers from business, banking, government, labor, and intellectuals. That means colleges, universities. He said the Trilateral Commission meets twice a year to discuss problems like the world monetary situation, economic issues, and military issues. However, those who have penetrated the inner workings of this group state that the real purpose is to overtake all key policy-making positions in government and to unite the free world into a loosely knit socialistic world government. Exactly what it said in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation. A Mr. George Orwell is a socialist. He wrote a book, in it was entitled 1984. When I entered college as a freshman in 1959, it was required reading in all colleges and universities that were accredited in the United States. This book showed very clearly that there would come a world government and a big brother system would run it. Everybody would be numbered and they would be tracked by modern technology. The January 2nd, 1984 U.S. News and World Report spent nine full pages illustrating the sophisticated technology that would be used to achieve the absolute control in a one-world dictatorship. Now, along with the SWIFT organization for setting up the transfer of funds economically and eliminate all cash, we can begin to see how this is all going to happen. Then at the same time all this was occurring, the senior United States magazine called Senior Scholastics. This was distributed nationwide to all high schools. Their September 20th, 1973 issue had on the front cover an individual with barcodes in their forehead. And when you read the entire article, the insinuation that came from it was, all consumer goods must have a computer mark called the Universal Product Code. 
then all selling and buying must be done by computer. Then a third inference that it made was that special drawing rights must become the standard medium of exchange. No money, no checks, no coins. Then it said every individual must receive a personal number. This was the inference of the whole article, preparing the minds of people to use a bartering system in the future. And then the conclusion was that they must tattoo this or put it somewhere on the body so that it would not be lost and so that individuals could use it in a special drawing rights. Another article came out. This was in the Chicago Tribune by a Mr. William Sapphire. And this was September 14, 1982, section 1, page 19. It was called The New Computer Tattoo. I will only hit parts of this particular article. He said the first step downward on the Simpson staircase, this is one of the representatives or senators in Congress, staircase downward to big brotherdom is the requirement that within three years the federal government come up with a secure system to determine employment eligibility in the United States. And he went on and discusses a national identity card. And it was rejected by those in the Senate and House of Representatives. He said that this legislation was camouflaging the true intent. The true intent was that we were all going to have to have an identification card like every socialistic country in the world. And his conclusion at the very end of the article was the following, I quote, We are entering the computer age combined with a national identity card, an abuse of power that Representative Peter Rodino, a Democrat from New Jersey, professes to oppose in the House as he makes it inevitable. Government computers and data banks pose a threat to personal liberty. Though this documentation and this, this legislation came under the guise of giving identification cards to every American so they will know who can be legitimately employed. And that would mean the people that came over the Mexican border illegally could not hold a job. He said, though it's aimed against undocumented workers, the computer tattoo will be pressed on you and me. He said it. And... I don't doubt for a moment that it will happen in history very, very soon. With the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, suddenly the world realized that a power had been discovered that could destroy all mankind from planet Earth. Jesus predicted this in Matthew 24, verse 21 and 22, when he said that what a time would come of great tribulation. He said that unless he intervened, because this would be the worst time in all of history, there would be nothing before it as bad as this, there would be nothing after it as bad as this. And unless he intervened, no flesh would be saved. So he would have to cut the day short. Albert Einstein made the following statement, quote, The secret of the atom should be committed to a world government. And the United States of America should announce its readiness to give it to a world government. End of quote. A Mr. Raymond Swing made the following conversation with Albert Einstein, and it was recorded in a book called The Day the Dollar Dies, page 132 and 33. I'll quote, Either we find a way to establish a world government or we'll perish in a war of the atom. End of quote. A Mr. Sumner Wells made this statement, quote, No world government of the character envisioned by Professor Einstein would function unless it possessed the power to exercise complete control over the armaments of each country. End of quote. 
Notice the word complete control. This is the key. They're working feverishly to find by the year 2000 because of studies made in 1957, then again right after during World War II, and then in 1967. And they found out that the population was going to be so great that shortly after the year 2000, the world would crumble and civilization as we know it today. So they decided to set about working for controls. Some of those controls that have now been placed into order, I will mention. But a Mr. Albert Pike wrote in 1871, he only headed up all of Freemasonry and the Illuminati all over the world, him and Giuseppe Massini. Albert Pike headed the religious aspect. He stated that before world government could be achieved, the final war would have to take place. He said there would be three world wars. Have we already seen two world wars? He said the third world war would of necessity be focused in the Middle East, not in the economically advanced Western Europe and the United States, but the Middle East. Those that will not accept their new age religion. Are we seeing build-ups today in the Middle East? Oh yes, Iraq has been a pain in the side of the United States of America. And yet the truth about Saddam Hussein has not been told to the American people. Saddam Hussein has had sanctions against him. After World War, or before World War II started, the United States and England put sanctions on Japan. Japan had no oil. They produce only 2% of their consumption on their own islands. The other 90%, 98% was imported. Those in the Illuminati who wanted the United States involved in World War II so they could found their United Nations organization, set up an embargo of oil to Japan. Japan had a decision to make. They had 45-day supply of oil. Either they go and declare war and get their oil, or 125 million people at that time would starve to death on that little island of Japan. They chose to go to war. They were forced into it. So Saddam Hussein has had sanctions of oil placed against him. Now his people are going to die unless he goes to war probably to obtain that oil. See, there's so many things working behind the scene to get things ready for world government. Like, why in the world did our men go to Haiti? Because the crime bill could not get passed in the United States. So President Bill Clinton went to the Black Caucus in Washington, D.C., who are members of the House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives. They're all socialist communists. He said, if you will vote for the crime bill and help me get it passed, I'll send troops to Haiti. We'll get rid of the military government that overthrew communism and we'll place Batista, who is a butcher communist, back into office. So we saw the crime bill passed. And now we see Batista, this very day of this taping, going back into office in Haiti. Oh yes, they're getting the world ready. But anyway, the third government, or world war, was to take place in the Middle East. Out of the ashes of this world war, then world government was to be achieved. Notice what the Encyclopedia Britannica, its volume, Great Ideas for Today, that was published in 1971 on page 345, they gave a summary of a 4,500 page constitution that's been set up already. For world government, they said there would be a chamber of guardians, a supreme court, the grand council, the tribune of the people, and the president. Those who drafted this constitution realized, and I'm quoting from the book New Money or None, page 184. They said they knew that the world was not ready to accept world government. So here's the quote. Perhaps it will take one more demonstration of destruction of the atom bomb to make people willing to surrender 
to world power. End of quote. Remember the Cuban Missile Crisis that we had in 1962? Newsweek magazine wrote that we were only one step away from pushing the button. That was October 28, 1963. Congress drew up a series of what is called executive orders in order to turn all power over to the President of the United States in case of national emergency. Just a few of those that I'll mention today. Executive Order number 10,995 would take all communication media in America and turn it over to the United States government. Executive Order 10,997 would take over all electric power, petroleum, gasoline, fuels, and minerals and turn it over to the government. Executive Order 10,998 would take over all food reserves and farms and it would be in control of the federal government. That's why they passed a no hoarding law in the United States. You cannot have over a 30 day supply of food in your home. And if an emergency would arise and they went door to door, they would confiscate all food that you were storing. Executive Order 10,999 said that they could take over all methods of transportation all highways and seaports. Executive Order 11,000 said that they could mobilize citizens and workforces under governmental supervision, just like they did back during the Roosevelt era. Executive Order 11,001 said they could take over all health, welfare, and educational functions of the states. So it would be a dictatorship. Then Executive Order 11002 said the Postmaster General, which would be a member of the President's Cabinet they're hoping for, will operate a nationwide registration of all persons. Could it be then that they will get all those people that have no number and assign them one? Executive Order 11003 said that they would take over all airports and aircraft. 11,004 said they would take over housing and finance authorities to relocate communities. Whole cities relocated. They would have the authority to build new housing with public funds, designate whole areas to be abandoned as unsafe, and establish new locations for populations. I call them detention centers. They call it something different, but they will interpret this order when the time comes. That's how they get around it. They write a law and then interpret it instead of believing it word for word. Executive Order 11,005 said they would take over all railroads, inland waterways, public storage facilities. And 11,051 says they would designate responsibilities of the office of emergency planning. They would give them authorization to put out, put all of the other executive orders into effect in time of increased international tension. All it takes is tension, the threat of world war, or an economic or financial crash. Now do we understand why they're going to bring about an economic crash? Think of a scenario. Think of this scenario for a moment, then I'll get on into the message. What if there were a time in history that were to ever develop when, say, some of our troops were sent to islands in the Caribbean? Other of our military troops were sent to the Middle East. Then maybe there were some sent over to the Far East in Asia. And there were very few left in the United States of America. Then what if they had designated a certain day in which they were going to supersede the flag of the United States of America with the United Nations flag? And they would put it above the United States showing that they had given authority to the United Nations. But in order to make this effective, they would have to use extremely low frequency magnetic waves and create the most awesome earthquake in the history of the world. And a national emergency would take place 
And since all of our troops were overseas, all of a sudden they would bring in the 500,000 United Nations troops scattered all over America. And the gates would fling open and the UN vehicles would come riding down the highways. And all of a sudden, the miniseries in 1987 America, spelled with a K, would come into fruition. I believe the time is ripe. Right now. I'm not setting dates. I will set no dates. But I will look at the fig trees, and when the leaves are beginning to come out, I know spring and summer is coming. And I know something is about to occur. The Illuminati stated that they would unleash the nihilist and atheist, those that are working for world revolution, and provoke a formidable social cataclysm that in all of its horror will show to the nations very clearly the result of atheism, the origin of savagery and of the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitudes disillusioned with Christianity. Because how would a loving God let such massive murder take place? A third of the population of the earth die in one war. Then they said, whose, the people of the world, whose deistic spirit, we have a desire to worship a God, will from that moment be without compass. It will have no direction. People will have lost faith in Jesus Christ. They would have said He was a hoax. There is no God. He wouldn't have allowed such a tra tragedy to happen. And then mankind would be anxious for an ideal. Somebody to lead us but without knowing where to render its adoration, says the Illuminati, they will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, Satan the devil, brought out finally into the public view. A manifestation which will result from the general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism. Both conquered and exterminated at the same time. End of quote. Why did the Illuminati set up atheism in Russia and the communist empire to be against the United States of America so that two adverse enemies, exact opposite, would create such a problem and a crisis in the world they would furnish the solution after the war had been waged and the population reduced the rest of the world would say, give us a Savior. And all of a sudden the beast, like Adolf Hitler, someone of that magnitude would come on the scene and finally world government would be achieved. There was a program called the Report on the Progress of the Strategy for Survival Product of the Club of Rome. This was written by Mihalia Mazarovic and Edward Pastel the directors. This was for the Club of Rome. This was in September 17, 1973. They laid out every nation on the face of the earth into ten global kingdoms. That's what they called them, kingdoms. So, is the world ripe right now? I want to show you now a small card called the Mark, M-A-R-C. This is a new Mark card, and the slogan is, Don't Leave Home Without It. A National Citizen ID card is proposed, according to USA Today, January or July 13, 1994. They were reporting from Washington, D.C. They said, and I quote, All United States citizens and legal immigrants would receive the equivalent of a national ID card under an expected proposal to Congress by the Commission on Immigration Reform. This is 1994, not back in 1977, not 1982, but this is 1994, and it's before Congress as I speak this message. 
This announcement of a pending national ID card raised hackles among patriotic Americans. A veritable fire, uh, fire, firestorm of protest flooded congressional phones and fax lines. Stunned by the negative response, the Jordan Commission backtracked, announcing that the ID card will be delayed for now. That's the key words, for now. They said that for 40 consecutive years with a genocide convention treaty. And then finally they passed it, but they never let it rest. They brought it up every three or four years until it was finally passed. The federals, that's the federal government, have not given up on the idea of the national ID card. I'm still quoting from the article. They need this to control the citizen peons. Mm. Strong words. Their master plan calls first for a photo. Barcodes. ID card for every man, woman, and child. Complete with a built-in computer chip. With a dossier of them on file in the card. The ID cards of so-called enemies of the state will be so designated. So everybody gets an ID card, but certain individuals' cards will also identify them as enemies of the state. Once the populace gets used to their spiffy new ID cards and sees how simple it is to buy and sell and apply for a job or a loan with it, the Federals will advance to step two of the plan. Under step two, the government will inform the duped masses that the smart ID card is no longer useful. In fact, the bureaucrats will lament. The card is an onerous burden upon the people. It takes up room in one's wallet or a purse. It can be lost or stolen. Wouldn't it be easier and more convenient and efficient for us to just insert a tiny microchip in the forehead or right hand of everyone? Then you really cannot leave home without it. This is exactly what they're planning. There's also another article that has come out and the title is called Mysterious National Identification Center Established. I'll quote from part of it. Is there any person naive enough to still believe that the recent spat of legislative proposals for gun control, identification cards, and other control of the people schemes are not part of an overall carefully planned and crafted conspiracy? If so, what I'm about to reveal here should open the eyes of the most gullible of citizens. Unknown to the public at large and conventionally unreported in the liberal media, the Congress and the White House have secretly colluded to build and establish a monstrosity called the National Identification Center. Located in Virginia, this facility will be completed up and running in about two years. That's 1996. It will be an, it will enable federal law enforcement agencies to use a state of the art computer system to totally control every aspect of our lives. Truly, Big Brother has arrived. And it goes on to show how everybody will have to have a national identification card and a Mr. Neil Smith, who is a representative, let it slip what is really happening. Here's what Congressman Smith stated. Quote, the Subcommittee on Appropri Appropriations, which I chair, has been actively pursuing an effective solution to this problem. But the problem we're implementing will take more time. Or the program we're implementing will take more time. The solution to screening people is to have a national center computerized so that local law enforcement officers can instantly access information from all states. All 50 states would be hooked in to one computer system. In other words, he said, all states would supply that information to the national center. 
And the National Center will have a positive identification system which will identify any applicant. Any person that runs into trouble with the law can be identified instantly. He went on and he made this very startling admission. We have invested $392 million so far in such a center. About a four-hour drive from Washington, D.C., and we hope to have it completed and equipped in about two years. We hope all states will be in the system by 1998 and will supply the information on a continuing basis. Meanwhile, we'll continue to establish the National Identification Center for this and other law enforcement purposes. End of quote. Are they closing in? Yes, they are. There was a popular science article called A Card with a Brain that came out in July of 1983. It shows and it says, cram a wallet full of information into one card with a brain. And it shows the card with your name and so on on it. With a computer chip in your hip pocket, you won't need cash, checks, or credit. This is happening in our day, right now. They're setting up for future time when the mark of the beast will be imposed. To be exact, right now, they're putting up universal product codes on every item there is anywhere in the world. Even automobile engines. It doesn't matter what it is. The smallest or the largest item you can find, here it is with barcodes on it. And this is the first step in reality because you see the universal uh, barcodes or product codes is marks. And the root word for the mark of the beast means to ink. And what are they doing on packages? They're inking it. The UPC code is the second most commonly seen. There's two kinds. One of them is divided up into two parts. They have five numbers on the left, five on the right. And it's enclosed with the number six on the right, six on the left, and six right down the middle. And then there is a second barcode type. And it is encased with one six on one side and two configurations for sixes on the other side. So no matter what set of barcodes you see on any product anywhere, it's going to be the configuration of 666. Now we'll go to the next set of barcodes. I will give and read the instructions for the purposes of the universal product code from their manual. The UPC code can be used as a common identification system. What is the mark of the beast for? To identify. Source symboling marking. Here's what it says. The economic success depends on the agreement of manufacturers to mark. What is the mark of the beast? Etching, scratchings, meaning to ink. The code number and its companion symbol on each consumer package. What about the definition of UPC? The UPC should be viewed as having two related pairs. First, a code or numbering system that is intended to identify every item sold by retailers. Second, a machine readable representation. That's called a symbol. That's your little lines and it has a number under the lines. And it said in the booklet, that this was the most remarkable achievement made to date in this decade. So that means literally the barcodes that are on every product will definitely be one of the major parts of the mark of the beast that is prophesied in Revelation chapter 13. And every product has it. But what about the human body? Are they literally going to put the barcodes on the body, the right hand, the forehead, or is there something yet more onerous over the horizon? 
Is there something in some way where they're going to be able to track you and I or any other person that would take this mark of the beast within 15 feet of where you stand at all times? Yes, there is. There is what is called an implantable biochip technology now. And it's a biochip. And it's so small, about the size of a piece of rice. And inside of this particular biochip, it has all the workings of a full-fledged computer where they can keep 1,600 pages of information on every single individual. There's not anything that they won't be able to do when they have this particular biochip implanted in your right hand or in your forehead. To be exact, the next thing I want to show on the monitor is going to be one of these biochips and where they plan on putting it. You see, there's two places on the body where it is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the right hand and the forehead. And so this biochip, in order for it to work properly, must have proper heating at all times. These are the only two places on the human body that will work to perfection, just like the Bible prophesied. Something in the right hand or forehead. So you won't have to reach for your wallet anymore at the checkout counter. After your food items have been priced, tallied, bagged, simply pass your right hand over the computer code scanner then it will automatically deduct the price of all of your groceries from your bank account and put it into the stores. It's not impossible. According to Tim Willard, who was the managing editor of World Future Society's bi-monthly magazine called Futurist, the technology behind such a human microchip is fairly uncomplicated and with a little refinement could be used in a variety, and this is their word, of human applications. So yes, they're getting ready for the mark of the beast. He went on to say, conceivably a number could be assigned at birth and follow someone throughout life. Most likely it would be implanted on the back of one's hand for convenience so that it would be easy to scan at stores. It could be used as a universal identification card that would replace credit cards, passports, driver's license, that sort of thing. At the supermarket checkout stand, you would simply pass your hand over the scanner and your bank account would be deleted automatically. End of quote. This isn't far-fetched. We've already seen automatic tellers at some of these places like mobile service stations where you just put in your credit card and automatically pays your bill for you. They'll send you the bill later, but it automatically charges it for you. But they went on in this particular article, and Mr. Willard stated that it's the possibility with this computer chip that if they designed it properly, it could be for tracking and controlling people. Isn't that exactly what the New World Order said after they ran their three surveys on population and came to the conclusion they had to reduce the population by the year 2000? So here is positive identification. And here is the spooky part. They said all you have to do, it, it just lies in your hand dormant until it is energized by a scanning machine and low-frequency radio waves. So when you run it across a scanner, it automatically starts to work. But until then, it just is dormant in your hand. So yes, we're coming to the time when the mark of the beast will be there. Is there enough numbers, though, and could this computer chip have enough different numbers to be able to assign everyone on earth his individual or her individual number. According to those who are writing this article, this small computer chip in the back of a hand the size of a piece of rice 
there could be 34 billion different numbers. So everybody on earth could literally have his or her own number. And no matter what the population grew to be, there would be enough numbers that everybody could have his or her own microchip. Now I want to show you the implantable transponder. It'll be blown up to a larger size. This has already been developed. It's being used right now all over the United States of America. I'm going to read, this is a page out of their description of their product that was manufactured by Destron. Quote, the implantable transponder is a passive radio frequency identification tag designed to work in conjunction with a compa compatible radio frequency ID reading system. The transponder consists of an electromagnetic coil and microchip sealed in a tubular glass enclosure. The chip is pre-programmed with a unique ID code that cannot be altered. Over 34 billion individual code numbers are available. When the transponder is activated by a low frequency radio signal, it transmits the ID code to the reading system. Independent testing has shown the transponder to be safe and easy to implant. Although specifically, now listen to this very carefully, although specifically designed for implanting in animals, this transponder can be used for other applications requiring a micro-sized identification tag. End of quote. Could it be that every human being under the Illuminati's New World Order might just need an identification tag in order to give you the right to buy and sell, my God says that's what they have in plan for you and me. Trovan also puts out an electronic identification system. It's called an implantable transponder. And they even show the different types of animals which they're presently injecting and implanting this transponder in. So if your horse were to get across the fence and in somebody else's pasture, all you have to do is run it across the scanner and it will identify whose horse it is. It will eliminate wrestling. Or do we still have horse wrestling and cattle wrestling? Maybe we don't. But anyway, this is on the horizon right now. There's another newspaper article that came out in the San Diego Union Tribune. Thursday, December 3rd, 1992. In this particular uh, article, it showed that veterans or veterinarians were helping to chip in for the, to help people with their pets so they wouldn't lose them. And the article went on and described how that this little microchip would identify cats, sheep, dogs, every type of animal there was so that no one would ever lose his or her animal. Now, the article that I want to concentrate on for just a moment was found in the Orange County Register. This was found March 7th, 1993. Quote, this article was by Linda Stearns. Often things begun with the best intentions are easily transformed into procedures that are less than desirable. Microchips aren't the perfect pet ID. Implanting microchips in our animals sounds reasonable enough. We own our pets. If they're lost, we have a better chance of finding them if they're picked up by animal shelters that are equipped with scanners. However, it seems to me that we're in the beginning stages of a larger experiment. Suppose these chips could be enhanced to emit radio waves that are readable at greater distances. We would then have a tracking device. Suppose we implanted microchips in our littlest children in case they're lost 
are stolen. We already have programs to fingerprint them. Why not implant them? But in the process of protecting them, aren't we in effect declaring ownership of them? At what age would we declare that person sovereign? Perhaps it would be decided to leave the chips in place in case in, or to aid in census taking or some other benign purpose. We could conceivably, conceivably have the beginnings of a whole society of people registered by some agency and traceable anywhere in the world. Perhaps we could find deadbeat fathers. Perhaps we could all be monitored for our movements and associations. Suppose those chips were further enhanced to receive what kind of messages might be programmed into an individual? And from whom? This may sound like paranoia or science fiction, but the technology isn't that far away. Implanting sounds like a good idea when we're talking about dogs. What will we say when it's suggested for humans? End of quote. Remember, these are all ready being used. Remember a Mrs. Hillary Rodham Clinton? Remember Mrs. Clinton decided that she wanted a health bill to be passed where every person in the United States of America would receive an identification card? And it was to be a smart card until there was so much ruckus brought about as a result of it that he said it could be a dumb card, no computer chip in it. I want to quote now from the American Council for Health Care Reform. I'll quote part of this. This came from Senator K. Bailey Hutchinson from the state of Texas. Read this letter. It could be the most important piece of correspondence you've ever received. Believe me, your life, your health, and the life of your loved ones will be gravely affected by what is going on in Washington. I wish I could knock on your door and deliver this message to you personally so you'd know just how serious this letter is. Your help is necessary to stop Hillary Cl Rodham Clinton's health care task force from restricting your medical care. Freedom to choose your own doctor to be eliminated under the Clinton plan for health care reform. And yet they denied it on national television. They've been filmed on every major network there is where they denied it. Yet you read the 1,364 page bill, which they say is dead right now. But they'll revive it. You wait and see. When you read it, the Clintons have lied to the American people. It is filled with restrictions, socialism, big brother communism spoken of in the book 1984. George Orwell, Orwell was a socialist and a communist. He's the one that told the world and wrote the book so they could begin to implant these ideas into the youth of America and other nations so that we would realize that we are going to be under total control at some time in the future. And you know what? Jesus Christ foretold it also. He's God, but the key is He has all power in heaven and earth. Nobody can stop Jesus Christ from His work that He's going to do. Nobody's going to stop Bible prophecy from being fulfilled. Nobody. Many people want to take up arms, but you know what Jesus said? He that lives by the weapons or by arms by the sword will die by the sword. What happened to the Branch Davidians? They were preparing to save themselves when the socialist, economic, and military system took over the United States of America. Even though they had broken no laws, they were murdered. What's going to happen to any other group that says, we're going to be prepared, we're going to take the sword? They're going to be killed too. Because you see, Jesus said it, and I'm sorry, he's my Savior. I won't apologize for him. He said, if you want to live by the sword, you will die by the sword. It's either Jesus Christ divinely protects us or we will submit.
to the new world order. Do you realize that you and I, if we've been baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins, that we are different than every other citizen of the United States of America? We're not the same. Every other citizen is a citizen of the United States of America. If you've been baptized and you have God's Holy Spirit in your mind and you are begotten as a son of the living God, you are a citizen of heaven, not Satan's earthly system. And when Jesus Christ says, if you as my citizen want to take up arms against Satan's system, you'll die. He meant it. Because you're breaking His Word. And whatsoever you sow, you shall reap. Jesus doesn't mince words. He says either you're bought by my shed blood and you are mine and you will obey every word I say or you're only playing church and playing Christianity and you're not really mine and when the time comes, I'll say I never knew you, worker of iniquity. Because if you break Jesus' word, you're lawless. Jesus said, live by the sword, you die by the sword. You see, those that are pure in heart, they are going to be in a place of safety. And I've been laughed at and scoffed and scorned at by people who said, oh yeah, churches have taught that before. They did it in 1843, nothing happened. But I'm telling you, all the signs of the times are there and it will happen. You mark my word, I will go down either as a prophet of God or a liar. Because there's going to be a place of safety for somebody. Somebody will be there. It may not be me because I may not qualify for it. But it may be some of you. And it may be some of those who are receiving tapes and videos. You see, it's our personal lives that count. I don't care about Bible prophecy. You can talk about it all you want. I can preach till I'm blue in the face. A third of the Bible is prophecy. That's why a third of my sermons are prophecy. But it means nothing if our heart is not right with God. Nothing. All we're doing is fulfilling Jesus' words. If we never show what's going to happen on the world scene and we never preach prophecy, we are violating the Word of God. He said to watch. He said to be instant in season and out of season. And when we're living at the close of the age, He said you watch world events, you see how it's all being put together and every prophecy of the Bible is being fulfilled. And if I don't stand here and teach you these things then I am disobeying God Almighty. And I guarantee you, He'll take His Holy Spirit from me, not as a Christian, but as a minister raised up by His Spirit, and then you'll just have to go elsewhere to find where the truth is being taught. And as long as I have breath, I will defend what Jesus called me to do. I will preach it no matter how many people get mad at me. I'm not going to lose my salvation because other people's hung up on little nitty gritty problems. I'm going to preach the whole Word of God. And I hope every one of you would want me to do that. But sometimes these things are difficult. Sometimes things are preached that hits us right square between the eyes. And it's not easy when it applies to us personally. As long as you think a sermon's for everybody else, it's great. That was the best sermon I ever heard. But when it hits you between the eyes, <gasps> oh, Man, I'm never going back to that church. <laughs> that's not any of our attitudes. I'm just saying that's the way worldly churches are. They don't want to be corrected. Brethren, if any of us want to see the fulfillment of everything in the book of Revelation, and if we want to see the book of Daniel fulfilled in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and we want to be a part of it, and we want to see all these things that are coming to pass on the earth, and we're protected from it, we're going to beg God to let us see our sins and our weaknesses so we can change and our character will be such that we will be in a place of safety. Because I guarantee what's going to happen when you have a little tiny child sitting on your knee and they come around and say, it's time for us to take all mothers without a car down to get their implant. What if you're a Christian? Are you going to allow that baby out of faith that Jesus will provide milk and food for you and that child? What's it going to be? Take the biochip? Take the computer marks? Whatever it is? Or are you going to depend upon Jesus Christ? 
We've been told by senators and House of Representatives members that that's exactly what the Clintons are trying to do. Get us to take a national identification card which will ultimately be the, impu the uh, implanted chip in our forehead or our hand. Where will our faith lie? Will it lie in Jesus Christ? Or will it lie in food grown on planet earth? It's going to be difficult. The strongest of us are going to be taxed to the limits. Our faith must stand because without faith it is impossible to please God. How do we know that we're not going to be suddenly given inspiration by God's Spirit that we're to get into our automobiles and start driving somewhere? How do we know this? When all of a sudden, the United Nations troops, maybe, and the flag comes up over our flag, and then they're dispersed all over the country to help those poor victims of an earthquake which they created to start with so they can implement their system. How do we know that God's Spirit will not lead us all of a sudden and we're to get into our car and just start driving and all of a sudden we converge at the same place because God's Spirit is a Spirit of unity and our minds have been such and we have been programmed by God's Spirit by submitting to Him that when the right times comes, we will read the Holy Spirit perfectly. We don't know how it's going to be accomplished. None of us do. And the Bible does not say. The only example we have really is two examples. One in the pages of the Bible. When ancient Israel, through Moses, led them out. And they went out with a high hand. But then the other example was when Jerusalem was surrounded in 66 A.D. Then the death of the Roman emperor and the armies withdrew. And three years later, they, or four years later, they came back and surrounded Jerusalem. And as they were marching up to the walls of Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit, some way with a light shone and a voice said, Vacate this place. And the priest on duty happened to be a believer of Jesus Christ. And according to Josephus, all the Christians spread the word and every last one of them left the city of Jerusalem. What if we had been there at that time? Would we have listened to the Holy Spirit of God? Would we have been one of those to step out in faith and say, we've got to get outside the walls of Jerusalem and flee into the desert area called Pella? outside the confines of the Roman Empire before it's too late? Or would we sit wherever we are, whatever state, and all of a sudden a gigantic earthquake takes place and the United Nations troops go out and they shut down the highways because it's an emergency and trucks have to flow with food to go into certain areas, medical supplies in certain areas, and so you cannot go anywhere. Then when they've gotten control, they say, we have to be able to tell where everybody is. We don't want anybody to have more food or clothing or medical care than the next person. It has to be equally distributed. So we're going to have to have a way to prove who got it. And they want to implant something in your hand or forehead. Will our faith carry us through? I've seen a trend now for months. I cannot help it. I don't believe anybody who's been paying, paying attention to all the sermons that have been delivered. There has been a trend where God is saying, get ready, get ready, be prepared. Get ready to move. Get ready to do whatever's necessary. But you know what? If you have been bought by the shed blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and you're dead serious about your calling, you will read the Holy Spirit when the signal goes out. And I thank God for a group of people like you.